We're in 1 Peter 3 this morning. 1 Peter 3, we've been going through this book and learning what the Lord has for us. As a church, and beginning in chapter 2, he started on this whole section, Peter did, on submission. And he dealt with different forms of submission in different aspects of our lives. And he dealt with submitting to submission in general and submitting to the government and submitting to the Lord. And also the Lord Jesus example of perfect submission to us even in time of trouble. And then we come to chapter 3 and he emphasizes submission in the home. Submission as men and women, and submission in God's church as we continue on submission to one another. But in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And this is our text this morning, verses 3 and 4, but we'll read through verse 5. Who is adorning... Let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. And that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the impact that it has for each one of us, the challenge that it has for, for each one of us, and the specific nature with which you deal, deal with details in our lives. And we pray that you'd help us to understand what your message is to us today from your word. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will use your word in our hearts to bring about change and spiritual growth where it's necessary and encouragement in the things that we're honoring you in. Lord, we pray that you help us in these things. We thank you again for the opportunity to open your precious book and to see the truths that you have for us. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, as we come into... This passage, 1 Peter chapter 3, again, we're dealing with submission in general, but specifically the, hus the, the wives and the husbands. And he begins with the wives, and he has five verses on the wives, and, excuse me, six verses on the wives, and only one verse on the husbands. And that doesn't tell us that the wives are worse than the husbands, but it does tell us that there's a specific role that the Lord wants wives and women in general to play, and that is sometimes a difficult thing. And so uh, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be a woman. And a lot of you women look around and you say, man, I wouldn't want to be a man. <laughs> well, why? Because God created us the way we are. And he gave us each roles for us to fulfill. And so when we do that, we're most happy. When we do that, we have the most peace in our relationships. When we do that, we're the most productive for our king. And we are the most effective for the kingdom of God. And that's how we want to be in our lives. Uh, we only have a short time on this earth. And so while we're here, let's try to grow as much as the Lord has for us so that we can be the most effective servants of his. Uh, that's the desire of a servant is to please his master if he's a good servant. And that's the way we need to be when it comes to our Lord and master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says here in verse 3, who's adorning, this is the godly woman's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting out of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So we can ask this question. How many of you ladies do you think you would say, by uplifted hand, I have a meek and quiet spirit? Is there anybody who would do that? No? Okay. That's probably good. That's probably a good thing that you're not willing to just say, I've arrived, because none of you have. And when we get to the husbands, we'll find that none of us have either, unfortunately. And so we have a lot to learn. And we have a lot to learn in our roles. We have a lot to learn in our marriages. And so God has this for us today. Last week, we talked about what God would have us understand uh, regarding the idea of subjection. And even in a worst case scenario, that those who don't have husbands who are even obedient to the word or perhaps are unbelievers, there's still an opportunity and a responsibility of submission in those situations. And the end goal of that, there's a purpose for it. And there's a design to that. And it is because that's the way you're going to win. That's the way you're going to win. Not by pushing your own agenda, not by being not submitted, but by obeying God's will. That's how you win. That's how you win before God. And that's how you win your husband. All right. So we're preaching today on the wifely adornment. He says, addresses this to wives. And I say wifely adornment, not womanly adornment, though this applies to all women. Okay. But why wifely adornment? Primarily in Christian circles, especially among those of marrying age, 
We should expect that marriage would be the norm. In fact, in our culture, we should expect that marriage would be the norm. Peter does here. So he's addressing this to all women, but he addresses the wives because he's expecting that women be married. That's the norm. So if you're not married, that's abnormal. You're strange. You're weird. No. You might feel that way. And that's not a negative thing because it's normal for Christian women to be married. It's normal. And that's why the Lord says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, through Paul, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So it is God's design normally for women to be married. That doesn't mean that it is absolutely God's will for you to be married. Okay? But that's what his will normally is for women, for Christian women to be married. Today, the culture encourages many and long relationships that fall short of marriage or no relationships, which is not God's design. This is not God's plan. These things lead to an independent and rebellious spirit, often to promiscuity, to the waste of youth. Certainly, they lead to a dedication to self and not to wifely and motherly spiritual service and to life outside the order of God. So if you're not a wife and you're not a mother, that doesn't mean that you're necessarily outside of God's will. But you have to be on guard that you don't allow the culture to force these agendas on you. The agenda of independence, the agenda of rebellion, and the agenda of being served rather than a life of service. This is what God's design is. So I want you to notice the inward focus that Paul expresses here, directing women to their home, to their husbands, to their children, and to their house. Not to a great following. That's not what God's design is for women. Titus chapter 2 follows the same pattern where the Lord gives instruction to the older women to encourage and advise the younger women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The inward look is the need of the hour when it comes to the home, not an outward look. Not a look toward a career in business, not a look toward a following, not a look toward political leadership or a social media impact. God's desire is for you to focus inward as a holy woman. In this passage, Peter, dealing with submission, brings this great theme of the inward look home to the personal level for every Christian woman, for the holy women of God's church. And so we can ask that question, are you a holy woman? Woman. What, is it, what does it mean to be a holy woman? Look down in the passage, which we'll address next week, the Lord willing. Verse 5, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves. You want to be a holy woman? Then you need to trust in God for salvation. Have you trusted in God for salvation? If not, then you're not a holy woman. You're not a woman who's set apart unto God, and you need to do that today. You need to come to the place of repentance and trust in Jesus Christ. Have you been saved? Have you been born again? These are God's words regarding our coming to God. Have you been redeemed? Have you been justified or made righteous? These things can't come about by your own goodness or by your own effort, but only by the grace of God working in your life through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. By trusting in Jesus Christ for our salvation, we can be redeemed. We can have our sins forgiven. We can have new life in Christ and purpose in our lives. But only if we'll do that, you can be a holy woman. You can be a holy woman. You can begin on the trajectory and path of a holy woman if you'll trust in Jesus Christ today. Don't delay. Do that today. Become a holy woman of God. We've already seen the wifely submission in verses 1 and 2. And noted the word likewise at the beginning of the chapter, reflecting back to the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw the emphasis on your own husbands for your focus to be on your relationship with the husband who is unique to you, to you because submission and oneness go together. True submission involves oneness with your husband as the submission of all believers to Christ involves oneness with him. We then saw the worst case scenario. Submission is for all wives, but it's especially difficult for wives of unbelieving husbands or disobedient husbands. But even in this case, submission is God's instruction because submission to God's authority structure demonstrates a changed and heavenly heart to the lost husband and to the lost world. And then we saw the witnessed style of life. The word there, while they behold, in verse 2, your chaste conversation coupled with fear. This indicates the observation of the overseer, that word. That is to say, 
that the husband is enabled with a submitted wife to be the one who oversees. And as he oversees, he oversees. Now he can see the testimony demonstrated. And what is he to see? He's to see the two observable characteristics of a godly woman's submission. The two observable characteristics of a godly woman's submission, fear and chastity or purity. Respect and honor coupled with purity of life and complete consecration to the Lord are what all, but especially the husband, can see as the evidence of a true womanly submission. So I pray that you've been working on this since last week, but second now I want you to see, as our heading for today, the wifely adornment. The wifely adornment is the challenge for today from verses 3 and 4. The word adornment is from the Greek word kosmos, which is dealing with the arrangement or ornamentation, the order specifically of the skies. It is the word for the world, identifying the arrangement of and the constitution of the world. It's used of the universe and of the elements in outer space, how they move together in harmony. It's used of the ordering of the heavenly hosts. A godly woman then should be well-ordered. And this is one of the passages of scripture that demonstrates for us what a woman's ordering ought to look like. As I've told you before, and as you know by this time, my wife loves flowers. She likes looking at flowers. She likes learning about flowers. She likes planting flowers. She likes replanting flowers and buying flowers. She enjoys gardening as a whole, but she especially enjoys the flowers. And from time to time, she asks me if I notice such and such a flower. Did you notice my, and she names the flower. And eight or nine times out of 10, I have no idea what she's talking about. And so I just look at her and wait. And then she tells me where that flower is and which one it is. And then I tell her, that looks nice. The other day, she asked me if I thought a certain flower was dreamy. I said, yes, that's exactly the word that came to my mind, <laughs> dreamy. In any case, one of the flowers that she mentioned to me a couple years ago, and just recently again, as in fact, as I was preparing for this message, she planted some outside at the parsonage, is called cosmos. Transliterated from this very Greek word. And when I heard that word, when she said that, I thought, I wonder what that connection is between the name of that flower and the word I know from biblical Greek. I found out that the flower is named specifically with this definition of this word in mind. First, the cosmos flower is in the family of asters, which is another Greek word meaning star. Remember, we talk about the ordering of the universe. And then the cosmos genus was given this name because of the beautiful order of the petals by the explorers who first noticed it in the Southwest. They saw the order of this flower and they said, that's exquisite. We're going to call it cosmos. The cosmos flowers are a hardy group of flowers. They do well even in scorching sun without much rain. They're a desert flower that thrives with rainforest beauty. Here's the point that we're promoting. The well-ordered woman, the cosmos woman, is able to display the glory of God even in adverse situations because she is well-ordered under the God of heaven. If the aspects of a woman's character were petals, how would they be arranged? What would be the source of their beauty? Here the Lord tells us, number one, it's not outwardly. Your beauty as a holy woman of God is not outward beauty. Not outwardly. At the outset of these negative instructions in verse 3, it's important to know that this phrase does not provide us with the absolute forbidding of hairdos or of jewelry. So if you did your hair this morning, thank you. And if you wore jewelry, jewelry that's fine. Uh, if he were giving an absolute forbidding of this, then there would be also an injunction against apparel or clothing, because that's the third thing in the list, and we all are to wear clothing. So we're not confused by this. Don't be confused by these challenges from Peter. But understand that the instruction here is regarding a focus on any of these things, an inordinate focus on any of these things, that might bring into question your position of being a holy woman. I'll repeat this so I don't have to keep on saying it through the message. This is not a complete forbidding of these things, but a command for biblical self-control, spiritual control, and order on these things. There's no exact definition that says that's too much gold or that's too much braid. 
These things must be sensed by the woman of God. They must be sensed. By the way, modesty must be sensed by the woman of God. We have our standards that we make at the church, but when it comes down to it, you need to sense modesty. You need to have a spiritual sense about modesty, a spiritual shamefacedness about displaying your physical body. To have no sense of these things is nonsense. Everybody's got some kind of a sense of these things. Even the lost culture has some kind of a sense on these things. And so it's very important for God's people, God's women, to have a strong sense, a spiritual sense regarding modesty. Those who have no spiritual sense regarding modesty are losing the spiritual battle in their lives. They're not focused on the things of God's word that he expects you to, expects us to, and desires us to. God expects us to have the sense of it. If you can't figure it out yourself, you really can't, you need some help, then look to the scriptures. If you're married, look to your husband. If you're not, look to your church. If you're a holy woman, then you will strive to understand this. And you will do all that is in your power to apply these principles in your present life as you adorn yourself tomorrow and Tuesday and each day of your earthly life. It is not outward. It is not outward, first of all, and that it is not drawing attention to yourself. Notice what he says, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair. The first negative for Christian women is that they not go about with plated hair. This is the idea of braiding or interweaving. And the women of the high Roman culture at that time would have these outlandish hairstyles, uh, according to history, where they would weed, diff weave different materials inside and outside of their hair, and it would be high or it would be multicolored or it would be big. It would draw attention to them. So when you look, ladies look in the mirror and you see your hair a mess, you should fix it. If you feel you need to wear some makeup, you should do it. I, I, I had a teacher one time who made this comment, if the barn needs painting, paint it. I thought, well, that's good. I don't know if the ladies will appreciate that. But, uh, <laughs> but this must not be that which draws attention to you. This idea of a woman drawing, her, drawing attention to herself is the very crux of the matter when it comes to the Bible word modest. If you would turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And look at verse 9. He says there, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So the opposite of drawing, your atten drawing attention to yourself is modest, shamefacedness, and sobriety. Shamefacedness has the idea of when I, there's too much attention on me, I'm embarrassed by that. But you know what the culture encourages women to do these days? Well, you should draw attention to yourself. You should let your individuality shine, and everybody should notice you. And you should be out there, and you should be loud and proud. That's the cultural agenda. That's the uh, satanic agenda, because it's contrary to God's word. Modest apparel, shamefacedness, that which is out of good order is what draws attention. When everything is in good order, you don't notice things. It's the thing that's out of order that draws attention. Excess in hairstyles, constantly focus, focusing on attention-getting hairstyles and makeup and your visibility denotes an imbalance in a Christian woman's life, not desiring and drawing attention. Also, it's not displaying affluence. The second negative is the display of affluence. Who's adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning, and here we have the second one, of wearing of gold. The word wearing means to put around, uh, to idea of putting jewelry around the neck or around the wrist or around the ear or around the ankle. Now, this was the practice of the wicked culture of that day. And we're not far from that here. Now we're not just wearing it around, but we're putting it in different places. All forms of this are used to display our affluence and to draw attention to ourselves, whether of our monetary riches or of worldly riches, or the riches of pleasures that we've given ourselves to. These things, and the things that we wear, the extra things that we wear, the baubles that we wear, if they're drawing attention to ourselves in, in an inordinate way, we're out of order, and we're displaying the riches of the pleasures of this life. We all wear wedding rings, that's normal. You ladies wear necklaces and earrings, that's bracelets. We understand that. They wore those too. 
There was, this was an injunction against ever wearing jewelry, but let me put it in a current context. Do you focus on jewelry? Do you buy a lot of jewelry? Is your jewelry gaudy? If someone doesn't notice your jewelry, does it bother you? Do you have to have the brand names of everything? And this goes beyond pieces of silver or gold and often even to extra accoutrements that we have, like a handbag. Do you have to have the brand name thing? Do you have to have the, the best thing? If this is the way that you're focused in your life, then you're out of order. Uh, those handbags, they have a lot of different names, I found. I remember when I was growing up, I had a piano teacher. She was an older German lady. She was something else, tell you what. And uh, Lydia Yucknot was her name. And uh, she, I didn't have very many piano lessons with her, I'll just say it that way. But she came to our house one time, and she was, she was a little angry type of a woman. And uh, she had left her purse downstairs. Well, I didn't know that. I was seven years old, six years old. I didn't know. And she came upstairs, and she said, go get my pocketbook. And her very, with a lot of in it. And uh, I couldn't tell what she was saying. And then she said, pocketbook. And I thought, pocketbook? What in the world is a pocketbook? And so I'm standing there ignorant. And the longer I didn't move, because I didn't know what she was talking about, the angrier she became. And my mother was over there snickering. She thought this was great fun. because She knew that I didn't know what she was talking about. And I was in trouble and feeling the pressure. So uh, uh, my mother really damaged my childhood, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Finally, she said, Jonathan, it's her purse. Go get her purse. She left it downstairs. I had to go get it. OK. Uh, but we have all, all, of these, all of these things. And uh, some women's purses are like, you know, I mean, it's like a satchel. You, you've, uh, you have your whole life in there. If you lose your purse, forget it. Uh, you change your clothes for a week in there, I would think. <laughs> anyway, you can have a big purse if you want to. It's uh, not preaching against big pur purses. But where's your focus? Is your focus on? the things that you have, the things that you're displaying, the things that everybody else is seeing about you, or is your focus on the inner man, not displaying affluence? Sometimes your husband or your close friend may purchase for you an expensive thing. We're not in a position to provide external judgment on what you have and what you use here, but we want to provide a caution for your personal heart not to derive your value from, nor place your affection on these temporal things such as silver and gold. Remember, they're corruptible. They pass away, as does our appearance in them. Remember, remember the scripture, who's, ador who's adorning or ordering and arranging. Let it not be that outer, outward adorning of wearing of gold. And then, letter, and then the third, not distracted with apparel. So we're not trying to draw attention. We're not trying to display our wealth and our affluence. And we're not to be distracted by apparel. Many women are distracted by apparel. And I'll detail what I mean by that. Do not be adorning yourself with the putting on of apparel or ordering yourself, arranging yourself with the putting on of apparel. Peter's injunction here is against running after the current fashions with the phrase putting on indicating a regular changing of clothes. Some women have so many clothes in their closet that they don't even wear them all. They've still got tags on them. Uh, and that's a dangerous thing. On the other hand, some women are just always trying to be up with the latest fashion and make sure that they're included uh, in, in the, the general display of what everybody else is wearing so that they feel accepted and that they feel uh, uh, beautiful and that they feel applauded by the culture. But if you're focused on the clothing you wear and how it relates to everyone around you, you'll find it very difficult to stay out of the immodesty of the fashion industry. The fashion industry is a reprobate industry. You need to know that going in. Uh, there was a certain university, a Christian university, that had a fashion department in recent years. And they ended up having a fashion show. And I watched it. And it was ridiculous. It was disgusting. And now then they had to backtrack and make all these apologies. It was a wrong thing. How did they get there? Well, they started with the fashion industry. The fashion industry is not your friend. OK? So you ladies, you should learn how to make clothes. That's a wonderful thing to do. But that's not the fashion industry. Stay out of the fashion industry. Uh, when you come to the magazines, don't look for the latest thing. Maybe the latest thing is fine, but just recognize there's a satanic agenda there. The fashion industry is dangerous. Peter says it here. 
Don't focus on the putting on of apparel. I didn't say it. He said it. God said it. Don't focus on the putting on of apparel, the regular changing of clothes. If you're focused on the clothing you wear, you will find it very difficult to stay out of the immodesty of the fashion industry, and it will be a slide. It might not happen overnight. It might not happen over a year, but it will be a slide, and you'll eventually become desensitized to the agenda that is presented by the world if you make clothing your focus. Don't make clothing and your appearance your focus. Many Christian women fall into the great trap of constantly trying to look cute, mostly for social media purposes or for the congratulation of their circle of friends. If you expend so much energy attempting to look like that which others value, you'll forget the source of true eternal value. I caution you ladies from involvement with the women on social media who list out every article of their outfit and show it for the world every day. This is what I have for today, and they go through all of these things, and it's this brand, and I got it here. Uh, even if it's a modest thing, why are you so focused on your clothing? They give their makeup tutorials. They spend lots of energy on getting the right shot to display these things. You know, maybe it's not even about their clothing, but they're out in the field somewhere taking pictures of themselves. Listen, if you go out for a photo shoot for your engagement photos or whatever, okay, we understand that. But there's so much glory in the flesh. There's so much emphasis placed on our human appearance. That fades very quickly. And as soon as you get out of the shot, it's really gone. And as you get older, it begins to fade. This is naturally true. There's nothing wrong with a good picture or display of beauty, but keep the main thing the main thing. Focus on your heart. I did a skit with my sister. We did it at New Year's. Uh, we called it, I don't know what what uh, everybody else calls it, we always called it a squat a body skit, where a person is there and they use their hands for the feet and then somebody else's arms come out and they do things and there's, they can't see. And so the person who's using their arms as feet, the other person's arms are out behind them and they're giving directions. Well, I did a skit with my sister that was a makeup tutorial. And it was great because my sister is kind of petite and then my long hairy arms came out <laughs> to do her makeup and it was ridiculous. Uh, but really, we should be able to do things like that and focus not on how wonderful we look, but focus on the inner man. Focus on what God has for our heart. If we're focused on our appearance, we're going to fail because God doesn't look on the outward. God looks on the heart. Man sees the outward, but God sees the heart, as the Ron Hamilton song goes. The dress and decorum of a God-fearing woman is not ostentatious, designed to turn heads. If you're dressing for attention, you're dressing for the wrong reason. Her general hairstyle is neat, but not overly intricate. Her clothing is modest, orderly, and attractive, without being in any way scandalous, flashy, or gaudy. Her spirit is bent to bring glory to the Creator and to her husband, and not to herself. You say glory to her husband? Yes. As the Lord said in 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, verse 7, the woman is the glory of the man. A truly beautiful, arranged, and ordered woman will not find her value in her outward appearance. I've known several women, young and old, who focus much on their physical appearance, and they devote, therefore, less energy to the inner man. Their beauty is temporal, and their beauty is vain. At the same time, I've known several godly women, some who were worn with time and tragedy on the outside, but vibrant for the Lord and full of the Holy Spirit on the inside. And when it comes down to it, that's the beautiful woman. And every one of us would stand and say, as we are in our right minds soberly thinking about this, if we put those two women in front of the congregation, we would all choose the older, careworn woman who was full of the Spirit of God, and we say that's true beauty. But in the moment, and outside of a sober mind, we get into this thinking that true beauty is what I'm wearing and how I look. These things are temporal. They pass. How beautiful is a woman who has a vibrant relationship with the Lord? Again, the scriptures are proven true and right. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. And beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. That's the woman that will be praised, according to Proverbs 31, 29, and 30. It should also be apparent to us that Peter was not giving an exhaustive or complete list of things that Christian ladies should not focus on. 
he's teaching here, he's challenging them, he's writing the epistle, and he gives them this list. And you can catch the spirit of what he said. You can almost hear it. Don't let it be this or this or this, but let it be this. And so he's not giving an exhaustive list. So be cautious about other things in your life that draw you away from having your attention on the Lord and that draw you away from finding your value and your appreciation from the Lord and from the inner man rather than the outward. So realize that the great challenge of this message from Peter is not in the explicit details, but in the spirit and the heart, as he says. The external things will come naturally, and you'll develop that sense of which I spoke of earlier if you focus on a right heart relationship excuse me, with the Lord. Remember, when God saves us, he changes us from the inside out. We don't turn over a new leaf to be saved, but we are changed into his image by a process after salvation. But we need to be those who have our spiritual mind straight about these things. According to Proverbs 12, verse 4, as a jewel of gold in a, in a, in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman, which is without discretion. So you can have all the beauty you want. You can have earthly beauty. You can have earthly jewels. You can have earthly accoutrements. But if you don't have discretion, if you don't have the wisdom of God, if you don't have the fear of God in your lives, then you're like a jewel of gold in a swine's snout. How many of you would like to be compared to that? Not me. You want to be a jewel of gold that's in the right setting. And the right setting is with a right heart. The women of the culture are often overly concerned with the outward. This outfit and that outfit, this look and that look, and all of these things. But God is concerned with the heart, the hidden man of the heart. Our adorning, your adorning, is not to be outward, but number two, it is to be inward. Look at, again at verse 4. Whose adorning let it not be the outward, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Let it be inward, not outward, but inward. Let it be the hidden man of the heart. And now we get to the point of Peter's challenge. Get your heart right. Uh, those women who resist the challenges of modesty, those who say, why do you have to do it that way? They've got a heart problem. That's the fact of the matter. When it really comes down to it, now maybe it's something that someone hasn't been taught about or something that they're growing in, that's fine. We don't all come to things immediately in the same way. But if over and over and over again you resist and push back and for a time unending you're resisting and rebelling against the challenges of the word of God, then you've probably got a heart problem. So here's the question, do you have a pure heart? Do you have a submitted heart? Do you have a servant's heart? What is your heart like? Is your adornment a heart adornment, adornment or a hedonist adornment? Hedonism is the idea of living for pleasure. The idea of having satisfaction and joy from everything in life. That's hedonism. So I do what things make me happy. I do things how they make me happy. And no one's going to tell me otherwise. I'm a hedonist. I want to enjoy pleasures of this life. And God says... You need to have a right heart attitude. Be reminded in your heart that all things of this life pass away. Your hair, your skin, your clothing, your body, your jewelry, the attention that you have, even your comfort. Some ladies, I wear this because it makes me comfortable. None of these things can you take with you into eternity. We go into the grave empty-handed in every way. And our life for Christ is what is going to matter. It's what's going to last. The Lord gives instruction for the holy woman, woman's adornment to be, first of all, invisible. Invisible. Notice what he says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart. The hidden man of the heart. The word for hidden is kryptos. It's the source of our English word cryptic. The meaning of kryptos is to be concealed or secret, hidden or covered. And so it is a wonderful, tri wonderfully translated word, hidden. Because of the great pressure on women to perform a certain way in this world and to be a certain type of strong, independent, conquering, glass ceiling breaking, news making, attention getting, in control woman, holy women are those who actively resist this pressure. And they take pains to focus on that which people on the outside cannot see. Instead of focusing on their outward appearance, they focus on the heart, the hidden man of the heart. Each person, man or woman, has a hidden man of the heart. Go over, if you would, to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 and verse 4, the Lord gives instruction regarding alms, that thine alms may be in secret, 
that thy father, which seeth in secret himself, shall reward thee openly. That word, therefore, secret is the same word we find in 1 Peter 3 for hidden. So the things that we do for the Lord are to be hidden. We're not to be displaying them for our own glory or for our own reward. These things are hidden. And who sees that? The Lord. And then he'll reward openly. Look at verse 6. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which, is, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. So can you see God? No, he's in secret. He meets with you in secret. He doesn't meet with you publicly. It is the same way, conversely, with us. God sees what is in our heart. He sees the secret thing in our heart. And then he'll reward us openly. Verse 18, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father which is in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Our spiritual lives are secret lives. They're lives that have to deal with our hidden man. But if we're resisting all these things on the outward man, and if we're seeking the world after the outward man, what pleases us, what we think pleases everybody else, then we're not focused on the inner man. Luke chapter 12, verse 2, There is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. This is the idea. God will reveal these things when the time comes. What Peter is telling us is that we ought to focus on the soul and not on the shell. Focus on your spirit and not on your style. Paul said, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. If you honor the Lord in your heart now, you'll have blessings now and you'll have blessings to come. But if you honor the world and you honor your own flesh in this life, then you'll not receive God's blessing now and you'll not receive it in the life to come. There are those who will reject this teaching and have the attitude that it doesn't really matter. Why are you making a big deal about these things? Well, the first reason is because the word of God does. And the second is because I can see the end and the fruit of these behaviors as 1 Timothy 4 just told us whether the positive or negative. And thirdly, because the biblical truth is where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Is your treasure on your fleshly desire? Is your treasure on how the world is going to accept you and see you? Or is your treasure on the Lord? There will your heart be also. So ask this question of your own self. Do you value the inner man, that which is spiritual, your relationship with the Lord? Or do you value, value your appearance, your attention, your value in the world's eyes? You cannot serve God and mammon. Daughters of God, says the Holy Spirit, let your adorning be hidden. It is not only invisible, but it's also incorruptible. There's a focus here on that which does not pass away. Remember, your physical body is corruptible. Job chapter 19, verse 26, the first part of that verse says, after your skin, worms destroy this body. Your body is going to be eaten by worms. Think about that the next time you take your, your beauty picture. Picture a worm devouring your body. It's just a body. It's just a shell. Don't place your value on that. This is now the third time in this epistle that Peter uses this word incorruptible. He uses it in chapter 1, verse 4. Our inheritance is incorruptible. And also verse 23. We are born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We have an incorruptible inheritance. We have been born again by the incorruptible word of God. How then can women of God stoop to the corruptible in their focus and desire the beauty of this passing world? Notice also the hidden man of the heart is what is incorruptible. Your outward physical body will pass away, but not the inner man. The inner man lasts. The hidden man of the heart lasts. That is incorruptible. It is not subject to the normal passage of time. The inner man does not get wrinkles. The internet, inner man does not get sagging skin. The inner man does not get age spots or those veins or bags under the eyes or gray hair or thinning hair, or departing hair, like mine. These things bespeak our human decay. So you're decaying. That doesn't sound very nice, does it? 
I'm not trying to say that any of you look like you're, you've decayed. But I do speak here of reality, scriptural reality. Remember the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible was put on incorruption. And this mortal must put on immortality. We talk about those glorified bodies, and we always talk about that when we're dealing with physical pain or some type of human weakness. How about having that focus when it comes to our physical bodies when they're doing well? Hey, this is corruptible. This is corruption, and it's going to put on incorruption. By the way, remember that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'll get to that in a moment. But also, not only is a godly woman and the inner man to be invisible, her value to be invisible, incorruptible, but also intangible. Peter tells us to focus on the intangibles. Look at verse 4. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. These things are not concrete, but they're abstract. They're not of the flesh, but of the spirit. This is not something that you can go buy at the store. This isn't something that you can uh, purchase and clothe yourself in. This is not something that you can go to the gym and exercise yourself into. These are intangible. Many women get a little nervous when we come to this verse. Meek and quiet spirit. Do I have a meek and quiet spirit? Don't be nervous. Rather, read what God says and heed it. And you'll be blessed by it. These things are not unique to the more jovial and animated women among us. This challenge is for all women. It is true that some women will struggle with these things more than others. Some women are more animated than others. Some women are more emotional than others. And so they're going to struggle with these things differently than other women. The, this is the nature of flesh and the nature of temptation. Each one of us struggles with something more or less than somebody else. We all have our own lusts according to James 1, 26. The Lord gives us a challenge here that is completely counter-cultural, even counter-Christian cultural, it seems, in this day. Society in this day also and the flesh. They say, say what you want to say, whoever you want to say it to, whenever you want to say it. Society and the flesh say, do what you want, act how you want, be your own person. But God says, I want you to be well-ordered. God says, here's how I want you to adorn yourself, how I want you to order yourself, how I want you to arrange yourself. He says first to cultivate a meek spirit. To have a meek spirit is to have a humble spirit. Humble spirits are submitted spirits. Humility and submission walk together arm in arm. This tells us that the godly woman will not be pushy or aggressive, but unassuming. This word has also the idea of being gentle and considerate. It is to be mild. Get this word, tamed. Tamed. Some ancient usages suggest this definition, to bring down. To bring down. That sounds like the Lord Jesus Christ, who condescended to men of low estate. And this is indeed a Christ-like quality. The Lord Jesus used this word of himself in Matthew 11, verse 29. Come unto me, all that ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Is this your spirit? Jesus pronounced this idea of meekness as a kingdom behavior with a kingdom blessing in Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. God loves meek men and women, but in this passage he loves meek women. God wants to see you ladies be humble and meek. That doesn't mean weak, but it means that you're under control. In fact, that's more strength. That takes more strength to control yourself. And like men are also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, 1 Timothy 2 verse 9 says, with shamefacedness and sobriety. Shamefacedness means to control your, how, how you, uh, your spirit and have a natural shame about yourself. Many women excuse their lack of meekness because, well, I'm right. I'm right. 
But God gives no excuse for being coarse or aggressive. Many ladies are rash with their language, not filtering their words by meekness. It is not good for women to be in leadership and assertive publicly or in their homes. That's the opposite of meekness. I know that's not a popular statement, but it's a biblical statement. God says holy women have meek spirits. First, all, first to have a meek spirit. Also, have a quiet spirit. A quiet spirit. The word means to have a quiet disposition. It is the opposite of causing disturbance. It's not boisterous. It's not brassy. It's not loud. This woman is not the center of attention with her spirit nor with her dress. Godly women are also calm women. That is, when those things which are riling to other women come up, these women stay calm. It means when this woman's spirit is wont to be stirred and heated until it boils over in a sharp tongue lashing or in gossip, it remains calm and quiet and does not initiate a disturbance. Can you see how this might be fruitful in your home? How it might be fruitful in God's church? Proverbs 21 and verse 9 says, It is better to dwell in a corner of a housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. You know what the brawling woman is? Not meek and quiet. It is better to dwell in the wilderness, says verse 19, than with a contentious and angry woman. Proverbs 9 verse 13 says, A foolish woman is clamorous. A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knoweth nothing. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 says, Let the women learn in silence with all sub subjection. She is to be known by a quiet disposition. I want to be careful to say that it may be that you're naturally more meek and quiet than others. So your natural disposition is to fall into this behavior somewhat passively. Maybe that makes it easier for you. But the challenge here is always needful to be watchful on. You can needle your husband in a soft tone too. Sometimes we think, well, if I do it undercover and not overtly, then I'm still meek and quiet. Or a woman can have loose lips quietly behind the scenes, like an assassin standing in the shadows with a hidden dagger. I think probably just as much as meekness and quietness are missed by the naturally quiet as by the naturally loud. Maybe it's just not as apparent. But I've seen many who seem to be quiet be very loud behind the scenes. I've seen those who seem to be meek on the surface be very rebellious and pushy and demanding in the background. Not all knives are large, but they can all be sharp. It is not God's desire that all of us turn into the same exact robotic and boring people like me. I'm boring. And maybe you're boring. And maybe you look at somebody else and they're not boring. We need a little, my, my mom's uh, maiden name is Spicer. And uh, she had a, um, her friends gave her a thing about spice. They would always give her stuff about spice. And it had a phrase on it, this thing that my mother had as a keepsake. It said, variety is the spice of life. So I used that statement. We need to have variety. I enjoy fun people. I'm not fun. My son Gideon is a riot. I love to be around him because he makes me laugh. He brings joy. Uh, my wife likes to be around him more than me because he's funny. He's happy. You know, he's positive. Uh, that's just a joke, OK? Uh, but we, we are looking, we, we, we gravitate toward that which is different from us. Those who are a little over the top, those who are somber, bring them down to a level. Those who are down on the level need to be brought to a smile by those who are joyous. So we have some difference there. We're not all robots. God doesn't want us all to be the exact same. But he does want to use each one of us with our own personality with our strengths and gifts that we have. At the same time, the Lord tells us here what is proper for his people. So we all take those things and we control them. We bring them to a biblical equilibrium in our lives. The Lord would have all of his children demonstrate his spiritual qualities, no matter their normal temperament. So if your personality naturally comes into violation of these things, you must actively allow the Holy Spirit of God to work and change you. Allow God to use your spirit for his glory and not for your own. This is the whole nature of this passage. Be overseen and controlled by the Holy Spirit of God in your conversation, your lifestyle. And you'll see the Lord be glorified. You'll gain satisfaction and contentment when your value system is changed into his. 
You'll see, see things as God desires you to, as they ought to be, and not as the world accepts as normal or good, or as you have as normal or good in your life. And then number three, it's not outwardly, it's not inward, but number three, it's upward. Or, or excuse me, it's not outwardly, but it's inward and it's upward. The Lord would have us focus on our, our relationship with him. The upward look. Godly women focus on the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. And they may feel sometimes that nobody notices them, and they may be correct. It may be that they're ignored by mankind here, that they're out of the limelight, that they receive no accolades, that they don't receive public praise. But it is contentment in this that brings the commendation of the Creator. The Lord is not concerned with how much money a woman makes, as our culture is. The Lord is not concerned with how valued a woman is by hell-directed society. The Lord is not con concerned with how beautiful a woman is perceived to be by the masses or how praised she is by the comments of passers-by. He is not interested in her conquests of leadership, her great acumen for fashion, or her skill in cosmetics. Even a woman's hair is a gift from God, designed for distinction and natural feminine beauty. God is not impressed by these things. Why is it then that then that so many women live for the accolades of the culture and maybe worse yet, live for themselves, for their own comfort or for their own accepting of themselves. It is because they do not have proper fear of God, nor do they have heaven's value system. Godly women have a proper fear of God. They recognize that they are in the sight of God. Let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, a great price. In the sight of God. The word here is not speaking of the eyes or the vision of God, but of his presence. You are now in God's presence. And one day you'll be more vividly so. How will you behave before God? That's the idea of the word, before God. Translated here in the sight of God, being before God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. He dwelleth in you. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Are you fearing society but not God? In the presence of God? Are you fearing yourself and your desires but not God? Then godly women have heaven's value system. Notice what he says, of great price. Godly women can see the beauty and attention of this world. They can see it for what it is, that it's fleeting, it's temporary, it's failing, doesn't really fulfill its promises, and it's falling, it's going to pass away. Godly women strive to live for the pleasure of the Lord of heaven, and they have the understanding of what he values. They don't mind earthly things, but heavenly things. They know that God sees a meek and quiet spirit as something of great value, excuse me, great value. That's what's precious to him. It's of great value. I read an article several years ago, and I was going to bring it this morning, but I decided not to, but now I'm going to refer to it anyway. Uh, it was a, an article written by a woman. Uh, on, she had some blog, and she wrote an article called uh, 10 Things to Get Upset About Before Yoga Pants. This was back in 2015. And some Christian husband and wife, I believe they were Christians, I don't know them, had uh, taken a public stand against wearing these things. And they ended up being on Good Morning America, having a dialogue with those people about their modesty and what it was and all of these things. And so this Christian woman got on and said, basically, if you're upset about people wearing yoga pants, you should stop focusing on that and you should start focusing on world hunger and all of these other things human trafficking, abortion, et cetera. Et cetera. So not, not bad things to be upset about, not bad things to work towards, but not something to act like immodesty doesn't matter then. So you being modest or immodest doesn't affect world hunger, right? Be modest, and if you want to work toward wor uh, solving world hunger, then fine. Be modest, and if you want to work against abortion, great. These things will only help in that cause, not hurting it. But she wrote this whole thing, and... I was struck by it and I was challenged by it. And a lot of Christian women at that time, and perhaps still today, were 
uh, tempted to go about in these things. By the way, yoga pants, I call them yoga pants. They might have another name. That's, that's the name I know them by. They're just immodest, and there's no two ways about it. I worked in the secular realm for a time, and I heard men talk about yoga pants. They, they desired to see that because they knew it was immodest. Lost men knew it was immodest. So don't uh, kid yourself regarding modesty. Modesty matters. Modesty matters. And there's not a gray area on those things. They're just immodest, and that's just the way it is. So even when you're not in God's church, watch how you dress. Be modest. Be careful. Uh, don't wear things that are too tight or too low or too high or whatever, uh, all of the things. Focus on things that are covering yourself, that are modest scripturally. God says that someone like this is of great price. But I mention this because at the close of that woman's article, she said, I don't want to focus on things that don't, don't really matter. She said, I don't want to focus on things that, quote, don't really matter. I want to focus on things, she said, that, quote, stir the heart of God. And then she, that was after her list of these other things to get us upset about. And then she said, raise your banner high, go on social media and use the hashtag 10 things you ought to get upset about before. Oh, but you want to talk about legging, leggings. That was the leggings. That was the other word for it on social media. But you want to talk about leggings. In other words, stop talking about modesty. Talk about this instead. That's not important. She said, I want to focus on the things that stir the heart of God. All right, fine. 1 Peter 3, verse 4. Let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God, of great price. <laughs> See, a modest attitude, a meek and quiet spirit that bleeds over into how you dress, is in the sight of God of great price. It does stir the heart of God. When God sees you modest in spirit and in style, God's heart is moved by that. He says, I value that. How many things in the scripture does God say, I think that that's a valuable thing? But he says it right here. Before God, in God's presence, that's a valuable thing. It's a valuable thing. God say, takes that and sets that aside. That says, that's precious. That's a wonderful thing. That's someone who's honoring me with their lives. I have this poem on the back of the bullets, and I like poetry. A little corny, but I like poetry, and I like to write poetry. But he says, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. In every godly woman's heart is a figure yet unseen, invisible, but it reveals itself as beautiful, serene. It labors in the spiritual, not subject to decay. And though it lives behind the scenes, such splendor it displays. It works with special ornaments, two heavenly delights. The first is gentle meekness, and the second, peace and quiet. No, no, it isn't often seen of men. It doesn't yearn for ears and eyes. But God above sees everything and says, it's of great price. And so it is the hidden man that's really of great worth. For that is what will lasting be when gone are youth and mirth. The godly woman's heart provides a glimpse of paradise, for it is being changed in form to picture Jesus Christ. How's your heart? How's your adornment? How's your ordering? How's your arranging? Is your value on the inner man or on the outward? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how it challenges us, how it changes us, how it gives us your direction for our lives. We pray you'd help us to heed it and then to receive the blessing from it. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.